Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's show, Kyle Bauer visits with Davina Rhodes with the U.S. Department of Ag. Then enjoy this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Next, Dwayne Taves catches up with Kay Johnson-Smith, President and CEO of the Animal Agriculture Alliance. Then Brandon Peterson believes every cattle producer's dream requires a jump start and shares how his dream began. We'll end with another Plain Talk featuring Kyle and Dwayne. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Grain Sorghum. Growers working together. Find out more at kansasgrainsorghum.org. Welcome to Farm Factor. Up first today, Kyle Bauer and Davina Rhodes discuss the advantages of sorghum as a food for humans and how she's working to increase the carotenoids in it. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer. I have the opportunity to visit with Davina Rhodes. She's with the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, but she deals with uh, people food um, and specifically sorghum as a people food. When I hear about sorghum being consumed personally by people, I think about the issue with gluten-free. Is that fair? Uh, absolutely, and that's... Um it's becoming a lot more popular in um, U.S. food products for um, its gluten-free properties. And a lot of people are getting to know sorghum because of that. Is there any limit to what sorghum can be used for when it's replacing, I guess I'll say, a wheat product or a wheat flour? There is. It can't rise on its own. So um, if we want any um, bread that rises, we need to mix it with wheat. Um, but we can make a lot of flatbreads with it, tortillas. Um, so it, it can be incorporated into those products. When we look at exporting sorghum for uh, consumption by people, um, I, I think of Africa. Is that mainly because of the gluten issue or is it because they're used to using the product? Uh, they're used to using the product. In some areas of Africa and Southeast Asia, it's a staple crop. Um, and so a, a lot of people are just consuming it on a daily basis. It's, it's incorporated into their food. Uh, what does your work involve with um, promoting it? Not necessarily promoting it, but working for it as a food here in the United States. Um, so right now I'm working on a project for um, trying to look at the... Um, increasing carotenoids in sorghum. So carotenoids are precursors to vitamin A. Vitamin A is crucial for, a lot of people know it's crucial for eyesight. Um, it's, and so the carotenoids are what makes a carrot orange or tomato red. Um, and it, it has a lot of other health benefits for your immune function. And, um, and so I'm looking at trying to increase the levels in sorghum right now. They're pretty low. And um, increasing it would help a lot of people in Africa who consume it, who um, have carotenoid de vitamin A deficiencies, which causes um, blindness. Um, it can lead to death. And um, and then in the U.S., there's probably only only half of the population is getting the actual recommended daily um, allowance of the carotenoids. So I had no idea the. Would that then be probably increased in all sorghum, or would this be a specific, if you will, prescription sorghum mainly for human consumption? It would be a specific sorghum. Um, it would be a kind of a, a value-added product. So it wouldn't be in all sorghum, um, but there would be like a, a specific crop that would contain the sorghum that could be sort of advertised and sold to food companies to incorporate into food as a high carotenoid product. Visiting with Davina Rhodes, and she's with the United States Department of Agriculture. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Folks, come back up to these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways, of course, 550 on the AM dial, 
streaming at kfrm.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego is driven by the spirit of American ingenuity. Come in for a new Chevrolet car, truck, or SUV. If we don't have exactly what you want, we'll find it for you. And we also have a great selection of used cars. We make sure you have an easy, fun, and transparent sales experience that saves you time and money. But if you want high-pressure salesmen and hours spent in the finance office, you'll just have to go elsewhere. Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego. We're making car buying great again. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Kansas Deputy Secretary of Agriculture Chad Bontrager joins us. And Chad, KDA recently released results of the elections held for the state's five grain commodity commissions, including Kansas soybeans, and it was for districts four, five, and six in the central region of the state. That's right, Greg. All the new commissioners took office April 1st, so we're excited to have them on the job and ready to go. And as far as the results are concerned, uh, who who were the, uh, uh, I guess, those elected in those three regions for the Kansas Soybean Commission? The three soybean commissioners are Ron Oldie from District 4, Kent Romine from District 5, and Dennis Gruenbacher from District 6. And let me ask then, what is the role of KDA in that annual election process for those five commodity commissions in Kansas? We manage the whole election process from taking candidates and making sure they get paperwork done to be on the ballot and then uh, registering voters for the commodity commission elections and sending out the ballots and then collecting the ballots and and doing the vote count, getting the results report. But it's also showing the importance of what these commissions do uh, for the specific commodities in the state as well. You know, we rely on these commissioners to make sure that we're using the checkoff dollars the best that they can be, whether that's for research for the particular commodity. Soybean Commission collects checkoff dollars, and they can put that money into soybean research or education or market development, and that's what the commissioners do uh, every year for us. And, Chad, when does the process start uh, for next year's election? Really, folks can uh, be getting ready here anytime. We are going to have available on our website, and we'll also share with the commission staff information for the election, and that will be available by May 1st. And then interested candidates have from then until the end of the year to go through the steps to get elected. A lot of them may not start until the fall, which is fine, but it'll be available starting May 1st. But the importance is to keep that interest there and to have these producers step up to the plate and be a part of that too. Sure, we need lots of good farmers that are are interested in running for a commission spot so we can make sure we've got folks that are doing the work every day managing the checkoff dollars. And that is at agriculture.ks.gov if you'd like more information. Chad, as always, good to talk to you. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. That's Kansas Deputy Secretary of Agriculture Chad Bontrager who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay with us after the break for more Farm Factor with Dwayne Taves and Kay Johnson-Smith. This Medford, New Jersey school bus runs on biodiesel, and so do these. In fact, all of these buses run on clean-burning biodiesel, which is great because the more we use biodiesel in our heavy-duty vehicles, the less carbon pollution in our air. Think how great it would be if more of our school buses ran on biodiesel. More biodiesel, less carbon pollution. More is less. Biodiesel, America's advanced biofuel. 
Hello friends, I'm Ernie Rodina. And I'm Don Dawson with the Better Horses Radio Show. For over nine years, we've been bringing the Better Horses Radio Show to markets all across the Midwest. We talk about God, lots about horses. We talk about cows, we talk about horse health, we talk to top trainers, and we even talk about Roy Rogers. We're having a blast with Better Horses Radio Show and would love to take it to a market near you. So visit our website at betterhorsesradio.com and let us or your local radio station know you'd like to hear it in your area. The Better Horses Radio Show is unbelievable. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now Dwayne and Kay Johnson-Smith talk about some of the issues the animal ag industry is facing. Dwayne Thames joining you here on Ag AM and a chance uh, while on the road to catch up with Kay Johnson-Smith with the Animal Ag Alliance. And uh, Kay is certainly a CEO of an organization and a group that, that has agriculture's best interest at heart. And, uh, and unfortunately, there are more and more people that make that job difficult. There are. Um, our organization is actually entering our 30th year, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, we are a national nonprofit organization, and our mission is to bridge the communication gap between farm and fork and to help the consumers really better understand the importance of animal agriculture. And unfortunately, there are uh, hundreds of groups in the United States that work specifically to eliminate animal agriculture. Their goal is to find ways to either make it too expensive for people to afford protein, um, too expensive for farmers to stay in business or just ultimately to try to drive them to a vegan diet. We think about some of those particular issues, uh, in particular one uh, that uh, they'll regulate us out of business. Uh, and unfortunately, given some of the actions of the current administration's cabinets, that's kind of felt all too true as of late. It's true. There are so many regulations and legislation, and the activist groups are, are lobbying very actively every year to push for more and more bans on uh, different um, housing systems, different production practices. Again, kind of in an effort to either make it too hard for farmers to stay in business or to make it too expensive for people to afford protein that comes from animals. Um, so they have used the legislative process. They've used ballot initiatives. We saw two this year, actually. Um, and unfortunately, both of those fell the way that the activists uh, supported. And, and it's hard to get across our message to the consumer through ballot initiative campaigns because they're very well funded. They're, the wording of those ballot initiatives is always so misleading that it really doesn't end up meaning what they say. And unfortunately, the consequences are, aren't felt for a few years. And so it's really hard for people to connect the dots. Okay, when we think about uh, the opportunities for agriculture to unite, uh, unfortunately, we haven't always been the best at that, uh, but putting our best foot forward together on a united front will take all of agriculture down the road uh, to more prosperity. That's true. Um, our organization really is all about that. It's uh, it, we're, we're called the Animal Agriculture Alliance. I think that really says what we do. And we have poultry farmers and livestock and, and sheep and lamb and beef all working together to try to find pr pr provide a common voice, a unified voice on behalf of animal agriculture to counter some of the misinformation by these activist groups. I was gonna say we welcome, uh, we welcome uh, more to join our efforts. The, the more that are part of our organization, the stronger agriculture's voice is. I heard someone say yesterday that uh, they wished more people would just ask, use common sense. Does this make sense when, when appro uh, approached with some information about agriculture? Uh, that would go a long way to alleviating some of these issues. It would. Um, unfortunately, those organizations are very well funded because they raise money on cats and dogs. We all love our animals, and in particular, most consumers really only have interaction with cats and dogs. So they raise money on cats and dogs, but most of their campaigns are targeting animal agriculture or farmers and ranchers. And it is hard for the, the consumer who's now four and five generations removed from the farm to really understand agriculture and its importance. They go to the grocery store, they don't really connect the dots again between the farm and the grocery store. So they, they end up voting for issues they think sound good on paper, but they don't really understand the unintended consequences. Our thanks to Kay Johnson-Smith, Animal Ag Alliance, joining us on Ag AM in Kansas. Jamie, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. 
Come back after the break for the story of one rancher's jump start that began his operation. Hey folks, Dr. Dan from Doc Talk. Have you asked yourself how can I help provide relief to wildfire victims? Well, you can go to the Ashland Community Foundation or you can go to the Kansas Livestock Association Foundation and make monetary gifts. Another way, you can buy this beautiful print that was painted by Dr. Eva Gardner of the Gardner Angus Ranch of Ashland and Clark County area before the fire. This painting will be sold through the Kansas Livestock Association Foundation and all proceeds will be provided to victims of the wildfire. Grain sorghum is one of the most important cereal crops worldwide, and Kansas leads the nation in its production. Over the years, sorghum has been either exported, used in animal feed domestically, or for other industrial uses. Recently, its use in the ethanol market has seen tremendous growth, with 30% of domestic sorghum typically going to ethanol production. Kansas Grain Sorghum is committed to sorghum research, market development, and education. Learn more at ksgrainsorghum.org. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor. Producer Brandon Peterson believes every dream requires a bit of a jump start, and he shares his story. The price of land and cattle these days can be discouraging for young people trying to get a foothold. But a South Dakota Angus rancher says dreams can come true. So I think if you're realistic with what you want to accomplish, realist, I mean really anything is possible, whether it's a cow calf operation, a registered Angus operation, a feedlot. Um, take your time, build slowly, build off of the experience, life experiences you either have or gain more and, and grow yourself into it. And, and you will, doors will open the further you get into the industry. Now at the helm of a 350 cow registered Angus operation, Peterson says it began when his father agreed to start the purebred enterprise while his son worked off farm jobs. My dad was home. I could, I could hire him or pay him yardage to feed our cattle, to take care of our cattle, put them in those pens, put them in the pens that I grew up playing in and, and doing other things when I was a kid. He says it's an option that could work for other young people. Family might have no long-term interest, but if they can get started, the next generation can step in later. And it gave us that opportunity, that gave us that place without having to own lots of land. It gave us that ability to get chores done without having to own a tractor. It gave us something to grow into, something to expand from, and, and to really, really just get going, get that foothold. Um, whether it's selling one bowl a year or 100 bowls a year, it gave us that foothold in the industry to build a customer base and, and continue to test the waters and see if it's something that we can do. For Peterson, it was just what he wanted to do. He credits much of the success, however, to a focus on carcass quality. You've got to begin with your end in mind. You know, you need to know who your customer is, but not just who your customer is, it's not the person buying that bull. It's who's the end user. It needs to trace back through the chain. Our product needs to be delicious, needs to be safe, and we need to be able to repeat it time and time again. So we need to start with the consumer, even if we're selling two bowls a year. At, at the end of the day, everything we do is going to get consumed by someone, and it needs to be a positive eating experience in order to drive beef demand and, and help all of us out. Or pretty soon we don't have a place in this industry because someone can and someone will do it better. I'm Bob Cervera. We'll be back after the break with this week's Plain Talk. 
Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture, represents grassroots agriculture. The state's largest and most powerful farm organization stands up for its members through leadership development, agriculture education, legal defense, environmental advocacy, farm safety, and risk management. Members also enjoy money-saving benefits. To join our organization today or to learn more, go to www.kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. There's a lot of different ways of doing this woodwork, but it's all of it still takes both hands. He had been told that uh, by the orthopedic specialist in Enid, Oklahoma, that they would have to fuse his thumb. And I said, no, cut it off because I didn't want it sticking up. And I found out about the Kansas regenerative stem cell and went to Manhattan. We were so impressed with how royally we were treated the first time we came to Kansas Regenerative. Well, we came in and he took out the stem cells. It took about an hour for him to process them before they put him back in my knees and my thumb. And we were out of here in about four hours and on our way back home. And I'm in here today to have my shoulders, my hips, and my back done. So I'll be able to go back to my sawmill, my shop, and do about anything I want to do. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Duane are up to today on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk with the persnickety Duane Tate. Hey, I'm not hard to please. Everybody else would just get on board. <laughs> I was going to say, really? <laughs> <laughs> Batman the movie, the very first full-length Hollywood feature film starring Batman, premiered in 1943. Oh, my gosh. Starring a very young Adam West as Batman. Fact or fiction? Very young Adam West. Uh, yeah, no. I'm going to go with fiction. It is fiction. The first 15-part bat part Batman movie series released in 1943, but the first full-length film based on the success of of the television series released in 1966. Okay, uh, see, I guess I don't even remember that one. I remember the next releases the full in length the 80s or 90s. The 1960s film included most of the actors from the original television series. So, hmm. there you have it. It was my favorite show growing up. Batman was? Oh, yeah. See, you were too young. Yeah, I'm 10 years behind. Yeah, it and was. And a dollar short. I think it came out on Monday nights at 7 o'clock. <laughs> a Batman, really? I, and I guarantee, and it was on CBS. Now that's in the, you, you know, know how I know it was on CBS. That was the only channel. That you was got. the only channel we got. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder it was your favorite Monday night series. That's right. It's the only series, series we got. I got. Exactly. Most of the time, you end up with a series after a movie. This was a series that they turned into a movie. Have you ever thought about that? No, I'm wondering and if that's most of the time or not. But never should I, be turned into movies. Oh, if you can make a buck, I'm in for. I'm into it for you. They can't all make money, can they? Well, do you think they do? I, there can't be very many lose money because if they lost money, uh, people would people be out of the be, business. Wouldn't be in the business. Yeah, rice Maybe. growing in northern Vietnam. It's a big deal. They grow a fair amount there. Yeah. Also, most of the now this is northern Vietnam, not North Vietnam. There oh. is no North Vietnam and South Vietnam. No, it's all Vietnam. Right. But North this is and South Korea. Northern Vietnam, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, Northern end. But the big thing with that is they a lot of times uh, rotate that with fish production. Fish? Fish. Like and what kind of fish? Oh, like shrimp. Oh. Yeah. I don't count shrimp as fish. Really? What do you count them as? Livestock? That's like... You rope them? They're cattle? That's commercialized crawdads. They're pets. <laughs> Commercial crawdads. And they're not Shrimp. fish? Crawdads yeah. aren't fish? I don't think of crawdads as fish. You know, I have never seen... Um, okay, crustaceans in general you don't count as fish. No. Okay. Um, I have never seen a shrimp swim, and it's on my bucket list. I have in a... Because they swim funny, right? They swim they, backwards. Yeah, their tail, their tail is just out they in front swim, of them. They sw no. No. They, no, their tail is behind the, them. <laughs> yeah, but normally they're, a tail but, but their head's pointing back. No, they just no? they just go backwards. How they do you see go where backwards? they've been. They don't see where they're going. Well, that's what I just said. Their oh. head's pointed toward their tail, no, right? Their head's pointed like my. I'm looking at you, and I swim. Right. They swim that way, and they see everywhere they've been. They so don't their see tail's where they're out going. in front of them. 
No, it's behind him, and it pulls down. Okay. Underneath. And it pulls down. And it propels the body backwards. All right. It's really well, hard to try and explain this to Kyle. All right. I need to go on YouTube. You need YouTube to go to the Omaha World Zoo, and you can see a shrimp swim. There you go. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. We're here every Tuesday on Ag AM in Kansas. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.